a minute or two for uh, to give everyone time to log in and we'll be ready to go in probably at 5.33. All right, it's 5.33, so we're gonna get started. Um, thank you so much everyone for joining us tonight um, for our Train the Trainer today. My name is Ali Slotik. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the Campaign Finance Board, um, and I will be your trainer today. Jordan Pantalone and Amanda Malilo are also on, and they're going to be manning Zoom and answering your questions in the chat box and also in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, I want to thank Assemblywoman Nellie Rosick's office, um, especially her amazing district office staff, including Isabel, for partnering on promoting this training with us, as well as the South Asian Council for Social Services, India Home, Chaya, and Women for Afghan Women for co-hosting with us and helping to get a great turnout for today's training and also yesterday's training during the day. Um, thank you so much again to them. So I'm going to turn it over to Assemblywoman Rosick, just to get us started today. Great, thanks so much, Ali, and all of you for logging on this Zoom. Um, as many of you know, we have a special election coming up in Eastern Queens, and then shortly thereafter, in June, we have a bunch more. So um, we're sort of the guinea pigs in this project called Ranked Choice Voting. Um, but that's why I'm so glad that you are on this Zoom tonight because thanks to Allie and her team at CFB, um, we're here to empower and educate you on what to expect. Um, a couple of items, uh, just uh, business before we kick off the actual training. I want to re remind everyone that election day is February 2nd and polls will open as normal from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Early voting is starts January 23rd and runs through January 31st. Um, pretty soon, um, you can choose to log on to nycabsentee.com to request an absentee. I know the Board of Elections is currently working on that, but for those of you who have um, issues getting to the polls or if you just don't feel comfortable because of the ongoing pandemic, that is still an option for you to, to just request an abs, a no-fault absentee. Um, you can do that on the Board of Elections website currently, and hopefully in the next couple of days, nycabsentee.com will be available to you as well. Um, and I just want to, again, thank all of our co-sponsors and the CFB for making this happen. And um, I know that I learned a lot through this training, and I hope that you will take this information and knowledge and go spread the word, tell your neighbors, tell your family, uh, because we really need to get out the boat again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman, for joining us. Um, all right, everyone. So I'm gonna share my screen, and I just wanna point out that I posted a link to a PDF version of this training in the chat box for those of you um, where that's easier to follow along there. I'm going to share my screen. And here we go. All right, so um, as I already mentioned, 
This is the CFB's Train the Trainer Rank Choice Voting in New York City training. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so what that means is this is a Train the Trainer, um, which uh, it's designed for those of you who plan on educating voters in your own community about voting this year in New York City. Um, if you're just a voter who's curious about rank choice voting, you may end up with a bit more information than you bargained for here, but otherwise you will still learn a lot. So welcome and thank you so much for joining us. All right, so just to set some expectations, um, this is our agenda for the training. We're gonna start off with an introduction and some background to give everyone the lay of the land. Next up, we'll get into a bit more detail about what ranked choice voting is, how it works, and the main questions that some voters have. Um, then, because this is a train the trainer, I'm going to get into a bit more depth about voter education and why it's important, our best practice recommendations for communicating with voters, and the CFB's next steps for educating voters throughout New York and what that process looks like. Um, so there's going to be a couple of scheduled pauses throughout the training where um, folks can ask questions and I will answer them. This is um, just best practice. If you could enter questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of Zoom, um, that would be great. I will answer any outstanding questions during the two scheduled pauses. If you don't want to type, just make a note of your question and at the very end of the training you can raise your hand um, using the raise hand function in Zoom. It's at the bottom there as well and I will call on you, you will be unmuted, and you can ask your question. Um, so that's just some ground rules there. All right, and just to introduce myself slightly more, my name is Ali Swadek. I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Um, this is actually my second go round at the CFB. I worked in the Candidate Services Unit um, where I honed my training craft, I suppose you could say. Before this, I actually didn't know anything about ranked choice voting at all um, until I began working on staff at the 2019 Charter Revision Commission. Um, and now I know way too much information about it, luckily for, for all of you guys, and I'm your trainer today. Okay, so who is the Campaign Finance Board, first of all? Um, we're, uh, for those of you who don't know, we are a nonpartisan independent city agency that administers the Public Notching Funds Program and engages voters through the NYC Votes Initiative. So through our work at NYC Votes, we partner, we work with our partners and volunteers to inform all New Yorkers so they can participate fully in elections and engage underrepresented communities through outreach. Um, this slide is really important and it's why you're all here. Um, the, the role of community partners in voter outreach is huge. We rely on community partners like you to get the word out to every neighborhood in New York City, because we believe um, that on the ground organizations are best equipped to talk to their own communities. We think this is really important. Um, and thank you so much for being here. All right, just some basic goals for this training. So what can you expect to learn um, after we're done here? So you're gonna take away an overview of ranked choice voting in New York City. You're gonna know how ranked choice voting can benefit voters. You're gonna know where to find resources and frequently asked questions, how to customize the training for your community. And we can help you out with that. I'll get into greater detail later. And then lastly, the best practices for training your community members. Okay, so first and foremost, the most basic question, what is ranked choice voting? Um, we're gonna abbreviate ranked choice voting to RCV just for the sake of space. Um, so ranked choice voting is a new way for New York City voters to elect their local representatives. Voters can rank up to five candidates in order of preference instead of just one. And this gives voters more say in who wins. It increases civility and reduces negativity in campaigning. And it can lead to more diverse candidates being elected. Um, I'll get into more detail about those three benefits later on in the presentation, and I'll also go through um, what the ballot looks like. As you can see, there's a little example right on the screen here. So who else uses ranked choice voting? It turns out a lot of different states and municipalities across the U.S. Um, it's growing in the U.S. It, um, it is used in 17 U.S. cities, including San Francisco, Minneapolis, and Santa Fe, as well as the state of Maine. Um, but like I said, it's growing. It's there are six additional cities, including Alaska, that voted in 2020 to use ranked choice voting going forward. So that's great. We're part of kind of a, a movement to start using ranked choice voting. And um, lastly, I know this isn't a huge selling point since, you know, 
it depends on what your opinions of the best picture nominees and winners are, but the Academy Awards uses uh, a version of ranked choice voting to select its best picture winner. Um, how did ranked choice voting get to New York City though? So in November, 2019, 73.5% uh, of voters voted yes on ballot question one to establish ranked choice voting in some local elections. Um, it was put on the ballot by the 2019 Charter Revision Commission and it's really important to know that this reform was approved by voters. Um, and I think that there, there has been some confusion about that. Like, is this from the top down? No, voters voted on this and by an overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming majority. Okay, so the reason why I'm talking to you right now is the Campaign Finance Board was given the responsibility to conduct a voter education campaign to familiarize voters with ranked choice voting. Um, but we're not in charge of implementing ranked choice voting, like administering poll sites or printing ballots. That's the city board of elections job. We're really excited to be working on, working really closely with them on messaging, making sure that we have all of the same information that we're providing to voters. Um, but we do have slightly different roles here. And um, we, we both share the goal of wanting to educate as many New Yorkers as we possibly can on ranked choice voting before the elections. Okay, this is a really basic cheat sheet for ranked choice voting in New York City. So first and foremost, it's going to be used starting January 1st, 2021. We're only a week into the year 2021, unbelievably. Um, so we're past January 1st now, um, but you haven't used ranked choice voting yet. That's because we just started using it this year. It will only be used in special and primary elections. It will not be used in general elections. And I'm gonna say this a lot of times. <laughs> throughout this training because I think it's a little bit confusing for folks and um, it's something that we want everyone to understand. It will be only used in special and primary elections for the offices of mayor, public advocate, comptroller, borough president, and city council member. So collectively, I may refer to these as city offices going forward. Um, and that's those five offices I just list, that I just mentioned and that are listed right here. Um, but it will not, ranked choice voting will not be used for any federal or state races and it won't be used for any judicial elections either. Um, this last part is important though, because it means that some ballots will have ranked choice and single choice elections. And that leads me into my next slide. So how did we vote before we used ranked choice voting? Um, before ranked choice voting, we used single choice plurality elections in primary and special elections for the five city offices. Voters chose only one candidate for each office and the candidate with the most votes won regardless of whether they received a majority of the vote. Um, so voters will still use single choice elections, like I was saying, for federal, state, and judicial elections, like district attorney, um, and in the general elections for city offices. So it's a little confusing, but we're, we're gonna talk about that, um, how to message that to folks a little bit later. Um, so another piece is we used to have, we, we were required to hold a runoff election um, for mayor, public advocate, and comptroller, if no candidate received more than 40% of the total vote in the primary election. Ranked choice voting completely eliminates runoff elections in New York City. It permits the same voters who vote in the primary election to determine who the winning candidate is without having to return um, a couple weeks later in a separate election. So that's a good thing. It eliminates runoff elections and um, we, we will never have to talk about runoff elections again in New York City. <laughs> Okay, I think it's important as well to just highlight a couple of reasons why um, voters voted to use ranked choice voting and why advocates wanted that to be a ballot question to begin with. There were a couple of drawbacks that were identified um, related to single choice plurality voting and runoff elections. Um, the first one for plurality elections is that a candidate can win with, um, win without a majority of the vote. And what that means is that um, they can win with less than 50% of the vote. So a candidate can win with 33% of the vote. That means 67% of the electorate had no part in electing the winner. Um, effectively, that means most of the voters do not vote for that candidate. And um, folks identified this as a potential issue. It, it happened very frequently in borough president and city council races. In the last 20 years, about um, two thirds of them were won with less than 50% of the vote and folks folks wanted to make sure that the people that were being elected to office had um, the greatest mandate possible to, 
to lead and represent their communities. The second piece is runoffs, uh, runoff elections have very low turnout, they are expensive, and they don't allow full participation in some ways. So um, what I mean when I say they're expensive, over the last 20 years, there's only been five runoff elections. Um, they don't happen a lot, but they happen often enough that people realize they were problematic. And if we're calculating over the last 20 years, five runoff elections, um, folks estimate that, that each election costs $20 million. So we could have saved about $100 million over the last 20 years if we didn't have runoff elections. Another piece, and I think this is the most important one, is that runoffs have really low turnout. Um, for the elections that took place in the last three years, the runoff elections that took place in the last three years, um, the turnout in that election was 35 to 65% lower than the primary election preceding it. And then the last piece is that military and overseas voters have to turn their ballot around so quickly for a runoff election that they often are disenfranchised. They can't return their ballot in time. Um, so now they can just participate in the one election and that election will decide the winner through ranked choice voting. All right, I'm gonna pause here for questions that have been unaddressed in the Q&A box. And just as a reminder for all of you, if you wanna ask your question verbally, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, and I will, we will unmute folks at the end of the training and answer questions then just, just for the sake of saving time. Yeah, just to reiterate, if you have a question now, type it into the Q&A box, um, and then I'll be asking those questions to Ali. At the end, we'll have an open discussion because uh, I see a couple folks with their hands raised. Um, so we have one question in the Q&A box right now. Uh, why is RCV only being applied to certain elections? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I, we got this question yesterday as well, and that makes me think that I need to include that information on the slides. Um, so we're, it's not being used in general elections because we, in New York State, we have something called fusion voting. <laughs> Um, and that means that a candidate can appear under the nomination for, for different parties. So you may have remembered when you went to vote in the general election in 2020 that um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris appeared in multiple places, Donald Trump and Mike Pence appeared in multiple places, but they were running for president and vice president. Um, so just the nature of the way that general elections work through, because we have fusion voting, it it's just not compatible with ranked choice voting and and we kind of determined that it would just be too complicated so it was something that was um just chosen to be used in primary and special elections but that's a really good question um we also have a question what counts as a special election so maybe you can talk a little bit about special elections yeah okay so a special election takes place when um when an office is vacant for a number of different reasons. And um, so I'll use the example of the Council District 24 election, because I know we have a bunch of you on this um, training right now who may be voting in that election. So um, the former council member in that district, council member um, Rory Lanceman, he took another job and so he vacated his seat and now that means that that office doesn't have a representative right now. So the way that we fill those elections in between the normal period where you have a primary and a general um, is through something called a special election. And something I just wanna note for special elections, and you'll see this later when I show a sample ballot, um, but special elections do not have, no, no one is affiliated with um, a major party. So. You don't have just one nominee for Democratic Party, one nominee for Republican Party. Um, folks actually make up their own political parties and they get pretty creative. So you'll see the examples in the in future slides. <laughs> All right, so we have um, a couple of questions about outreach that I'm actually just gonna let folks know. I'm gonna save that for when we're talking about voter education and outreach. Cool. Um, so, Someone asked, um, what about voters that are independent and don't belong to a political party because primary elections are party specific? And can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's also a really good question. Um, so in order to, for those of you who um, don't know, in order to participate in a primary election, you have to be registered for the political party that's holding a primary. 
Um, so for, for those voters who are unaffiliated with a political party, um, they wouldn't have a primary election to vote in. And unfortunately, that means that they won't be able to use ranked choice voting in the primary election. Um, however, any voter, um, no matter what your political party affiliation is, can vote in a special election. So there's special elections that are currently scheduled for um, Council District 24 in Queens, Council District 31 in Queens, as well as two council districts in the Bronx, 11 and 15. So in those races, all voters can vote who are registered. Um, okay, so we have, we have a few other questions I think I'm going to save for after the next segment of the training. Okay. Um, because I think like we're going to get into some of these details a little bit and I think it'll be really just like appropriately linked to what you're going to talk about next. Awesome. All right. Great to hear. Okay. So um, now we're going to get into the fun stuff of how does ranked choice voting work. Um, so let's get first into the most important part, the steps for marking a ballot. Um, so every voter these are your steps for marking your ballot. You pick your first choice candidate and completely fill in the oval next to their name under the first column. If you have a second choice candidate, you fill in the oval next to their name under the second column. You can rank up to five candidates or as many as are running in that election. Um, you can also vote for one or two candidates if you want. It's up to you. Um, but I would just like to note here that ranking fewer candidates does increase your chances for um, your ballot to be exhausted. And that's something that is a complicated term because it's new to ranked choice voting and I will explain it later. Um, but your main takeaway here is that um, you're ranking candidates, you're filling in your first choice candidate in the first choice column, you're filling your second choice in the second choice column. So this is what I was talking about when I said I would show a sample ballot. Um, we're really excited that the Board of Elections sent over a sample ballot for the 24th Council District Special Election. I know, again, a lot of you are on this call, so this is what the sample ballot looks like for English, Spanish, and Bengali. I will note that you may not have Bengali on your ballot. It depends on what election district and assembly district you're in. Um, but you can see here each of the candidates has their own party name. So you have A Better Queens, Your Voice Matters, Community First. Um, so you don't have to be affiliated with a political party to vote in a special election. And this is exactly what the ballot looks like for ranked choice voting there. Um, I also just wanna highlight on this page too, at the very bottom, there's the option to write in a candidate. And um, so basically it's exactly how you would have voted for a write-in candidate before you write the name on the write-in line. But the only difference is you fill in the oval next to the appropriate rank that you want that um, candidate to have. So if you, want that, if you want to rank that person first, you would fill in the oval in the first choice column. Okay, some potential ballot marking errors that we just want to highlight for folks. Um, the first one is overvoting. Um, and that's a fancy term for giving multiple candidates the same rank. Um, as you can see in the example here on this page, this voter has ranked candidate B and candidate C in the first choice column. Um, it's not clear what candidate this voter intended to vote for in rank one. Um, so this error would invalidate your ballot, which is unfortunate, but if you're voting in person, when you put your ballot through the ballot scanner, the ballot scanner would actually tell you that you made this error and you would be able to fill out a new ballot. So that's great news um, and just something to be aware of though, if that happens to you, that just means that you maybe had an overvote. And we want folks to know about this so that we can prevent the fact that there would be overvotes. The solution for this is to just make sure, of course, that there's only one candidate voted for in each column. Okay, so the second ballot marking error I'm gonna highlight is called duplicate ranking. And that's giving the same candidate multiple ranks. As you can see in this example ballot, the voter has ranked candidate B for one, two, three, four, and five. They really liked this candidate or they didn't realize that um, there's no benefit to ranking your favorite candidate for multiple rankings. Um, if you do this, only your top ranking for them is gonna count anyway. Um, and you'll see why once I go through the tabulation process. 
this is the same exact thing as just voting for candidate B as number one. There's no strategic benefit to doing this. So don't do it. Okay, so I mentioned the term exhausted ballots earlier and um, as the reason for why you don't wanna just vote for one candidate. This is a new concept as a result of ranked choice voting. So I just wanted to give you guys a short intro to it. Um, an exhausted ballot is, a, a voter's ballot is exhausted um, when all the candidates a voter has ranked have lost, even though two or more candidates remain in the race. And this might happen because a voter chooses not to rank all or many candidates and because a voter ranked as many candidates as allowed on the ballot paper. So um, since in New York City we can rank five, um, it's not going to happen as often in other ranked choice voting jurisdictions that only allow voters to rank three. And I'm sure this will cause a lot of questions and I'm happy to answer them at the break as well. Okay, so now I'm gonna explain the counting process. So round one is really simple. All first choice votes are counted from every voter's ballot. If a candidate receives more than 50% of those votes, they win. And that's just immediately they would win. And you can see in this example, candidate B has 54% of the first choice votes. Um, if no candidate gets more than 50% of first choice votes, and you can see in this example, all four candidates have less than 50%, counting then continues into rounds. So in each round, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated. And I'm gonna explain this by walking through a single voter's example ballot, which is just shown on the left there. This voter, um, this individual voter ranked candidate D as her first choice. Candidate D also happens to have the fewest number of votes in this round. They only got 12% of first choice votes. So what that means is candidate D is eliminated in round two. The 12% of voters who chose candidate D in this round have their vote moved to the next highest ranked candidate on each of their ballots. So for our example voter, candidate C is ranked second. And you can see that on the ballot on the left that candidate C is ranked in the second column. So this voter's vote moves to candidate C, but not every voter ranked candidate C second. Some ranked candidate B or candidate A, and so their votes move to whomever they voted for next. And you can kind of see in this graphic on the right that the votes, some, the 12% of voters who voted for candidate D, some of them voted for C, some of them voted for B, some of them voted for A. This means that the vote totals for those three candidates are increased. So for the original voters, candidate A gains 4% from 27 to 32. Candidate B gains 6% from uh, 39 to 45. Candidate C gains 2% from 22 to 24. And so if you're keeping track, our example voter again, voted for candidate C second. So that's where her vote goes. All right, so this continues in rounds. I think you all see where this is going. In each round, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated, exactly like last round. Um, our example voter ranked candidate C as her second choice. Of the remaining three candidates, candidate C now has the fewest number of votes in this round with only 24%. And so just like last round, same thing happens. Candidate C is eliminated. The 24% of voters who chose candidate C in this round have their vote moved to the next highest ranked candidate on each of their individual ballots. So again, for our example voter only here, candidate B is ranked third. Her vote is gonna move to candidate B. Not every voter's vote is gonna move to candidate B because some of the voters voted for candidate A and their, so their votes move to whomever they voted for next. And again, that's only for the people who voted for candidate C in this round. This increases the vote totals for our two remaining candidates, A and B, and the counting process is now over because there are two remaining candidates and candidate B wins with 58% of the vote. Um, thankfully, all of this tabulation happens on a computer, same as, as how election results are computed right now. Um, there is the added complexity of, um, you know, the multiple rounds of shifting votes, but um, for voters, they're just completing their ballot. You don't have to do any of this addition. It's all, all of the tabulation is happening behind the scenes. 
Okay, so just some main takeaways for voters here. You can rank up to five candidates, but you do not need to rank a total of five. Um, sometimes that's a little confusing for people, like there's five available options, but you don't have to use all five of them. And if there's not five candidates running, there may only be three. There's only gonna be three options available. So if you rank five candidates, five votes do not get counted. You always only have one active vote. And then if you prefer, you can still vote for just your first choice candidate. Um, ranking other candidates does not harm your first choice. And if you choose to only vote for one candidate, you do, you do run the risk of having your vote, uh, your ballot be exhausted because once that candidate's eliminated, there's nowhere else for your vote to go. By ranking multiple candidates, you can still impact who gets elected, even if your top choice does not win. And we saw that really clearly in the example that I was showing you because our example voter kept voting for the candidate who finished in last place in each round, but their ballot was still active by the end. They got to choose who won. Um, so ranking multiple candidates ensures your vote will go, toward, will go towards your second, third, fourth, or fifth choice if your top choice is eliminated. So this gives you more say in who wins. All right, so here's the last piece you need to know. As we saw in 2020, the winner in some races won't be known on election night. So it's important to set expectations for when results might be known. Um, it may take a week or longer to count all votes since absentee ballots can be received up to 10 days after an election. Um, so that's just something that's a note for everyone on this call that um, because it's so important to have all first choice votes counted in a ranked choice voting election in order to make the determination whether you go through that tabulation process, it may just take a bit longer um, to determine the winner. All right, so I'm gonna pause to answer questions that are unaddressed in the Q&A box. All right, again, just a reminder, I'm gonna leave some of the outreach questions until after the next section. Um, but one question is to what extent do voters who choose not to rank their choices, so let's say they only choose like one or maybe three candidates, uh, how does that impact the outcome in terms of potential one-offs and et cetera? Sorry, can you this is, this is very related to a question that came up also in the chat box. If you can talk a little bit about what is an exhausted ballot, because I think if we can just go over that concept again, it will answer this question about what happens when voters choose not to rank all of their choices. Okay, so an exhausted ballot is uh, a voter's ballot where all of the candidates that a voter ranked have lost, even though there's candidates that remain in the race. So um, I'll try and pinpoint a, a situation where that could have happened in the example here. So if we want to go to, um, let's imagine that our example voter had only voted for, let's see, the has, had only voted for um, one candidate. He, this voter only voted for candidate D. Because that candidate got eliminated and had the lowest number of votes, there's nowhere else for this voter's ballot where this where for this ballot to go there's no next step so essentially what would happen is they would just have voted for the losing candidate here all right just to go back a little bit someone said sorry if i missed this um did you address how rcv would affect candidates who are listed for multiple parties like working families and in, in the democratic parties would that mean they're only listed once, but parties are listed under each name? So I think this gets to the type of elections question. Okay, so, oh wait, hold on. Um, so easy answer for this. We're not using ranked choice voting in general elections. So there will be no situation where um, a candidate is, is um, nominated by the Democratic Party and the Working Families Party and would appear on the ballot at the same time. Um, the example that I was giving for special elections is each candidate makes up their own political party. So there is no um, party nomination. There are unique parties in the special elections. And so this is how you end up with every voter being able to vote in special elections. There's no, um, there's no requirement to be registered for political party like there is for a primary election. So we actually have several questions that I think sort of get to the same thing. Clearly, there is a crowded council uh, special election coming up. 
Uh, in a crowded race where there's maybe more than five candidates, what happens? So that's going to be true of city council. We know it is true for mayor. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about what that looks like. Yeah, sure. So, oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> realized that I was sharing the screen. Okay, um, so in the example ballot that I have up here, there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight candidates, I probably should have known that, um, who are, who made the ballot for the district, uh, city council district 24 race. Um, so you're still only able to rank five candidates. So if you know all of these candidates exactly how you would rank them, you unfortunately cannot rank three of them. And I think that's just the limitations of how this was designed. Um, if you do studies of the way that people can keep track of things in their brain, I think you kind of have less strong opinions after five or six things. So um, for the sake of space and also for the sake of space in people's brains, it was limited to five ranks, but, the, but that does unfortunately mean that you can't rank three of these candidates. So someone also asked sort of a related question. Can you explain further what each number represents? Is one most satisfied or five least satisfied? I think that could be in terms of like on a poll or something. So maybe we could just talk a little bit about ranking of preferences. Yes, okay. So number one, you only wanna vote for one candidate in each column. Um, you do not wanna rank it, it, this isn't a um, most satisfied, least satisfied situation. This is like, you're only ranking one candidate one, you're only ranking one candidate two, you're only ranking one candidate three, and so on. Um, I like the idea of that. That's a whole different other type of voting, and I won't even get into it. <laughs> well, it makes me think of what you talk about, and we don't often say this in public, but I think it's helpful to explain it here, of like, your, who you rank first is your most favorite candidate. Yes, who, it's who your you most favorite candidate. Is your second most favorite candidate. Um, yeah. You, you really are ranking them in the order that you like them the most up to five. Exactly. And you are only ranking one candidate as your most favorite. There can only be most, one most favorite candidate and only one first choice candidate <laughs> is, the, is I think the rule that I'm going to put in. Um, so we have a couple of questions that I think get to tabulation. Um, mm -hmm. so Nicole asked, did the majority base number change? I think this is about tabulation and like what we were talking about before, just in terms of when ballots get exhausted, how, like, what does the math look like when you get to those final two winners or those, those like top two candidates? Yeah. Okay. So in elections where there are more candidates running than there are rankings. So that's true in this special election, on this special election ballot as well. Um, in theoretically, you could go down to, you could do eight rounds of counting because there's eight, there's, or sorry, seven rounds of counting because there's eight candidates and you need to finish with two. So um, what ends up happening is you have ballots that didn't rank all of the candidates and they essentially drop off of the count. So this is why we advise folks, um, rank your whole ballot to the extent that you want to and to the extent that you have uh, opinions on who should be ranked. You wanna avoid having your ballot drop off, be exhausted. Um, and so, the. The important thing to know is the 50% threshold only comes into play in the first round where you determine like, you know, you determine which road you're going to take. Are we going to do the RCV tabulation? No candidate got, got more than 50% of the vote. Or is there an outright winner? There is a person who won with 50% of the vote. There's no way that any other candidate could get more than 50% of the vote because this candidate did. Um, and we're declaring the winner in the first round. After we move into the ranked choice voting tabulation, it's just all of the votes get distributed until there's two candidates left. And the person with the most votes is the winner. All right, so I have a couple more questions sort of related to tabulation and what kind of outcomes that we see. Um, I do also, we had a question, and maybe you can go back to the slide that shows if someone fills out for the candidate that 
they rank them one, two, three, four, and five, and talk a little mm. bit about how that vote will be counted. Yeah, sure. Oops. Okay, so in an instance of duplicate ranking, and there's also another term, it's called bullet voting. There is absolutely no reason to do that here um, in ranked choice voting. The person that you're voting for, in this instance, candidate B, um, voting for them one, two, three, four, five, there's no reason to do that. It's the, functionally, it's equivalent of just voting for them first. If the candidate is eliminated, where does your ballot go next? You don't have a different candidate ranked for number two. You don't have a different candidate even ranked for number three. So we do not recommend doing this. If, um, if you don't want to rank any more candidates, you can just rank candidate B as number one, but this is technically not a correctly filled out ballot. I don't know if that answers that question. <laughs> Um, yeah, so your first choice vote would count, but like all those other rankings would basically be ignored. Your vote will not be today if you do that, but you know, candidate yeah. would be listed as your preference and that's it. So if you're exactly. exhausted, too bad, <laughs> basically. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So don't do this. Don't rank one candidate for all of the ranks. <laughs> so we also have a question like, and this is a little bit of like a math game. Uh, if five people voted in the election, just five, uh, okay. three ranked more than one candidate, would the majority change from the, like based on the three who ranked from the first round to the second round? Basically, like, could you see outcomes change if some people rank and some people don't and ballots get exhausted? I, I, to be quite honest with you, I'm really bad at answering questions like this where I don't have a pen handy and can't like push through the math. Um, I, I'm not sure what the question is that is trying to be gotten to. <laughs> Maybe this is better asked at the end and this person can raise their hand. <laughs> that is totally fine. <laughs> um, so just I want to get to accessibility of ballots for a moment because we've gotten a couple of questions about that. So um, one question was seniors and the disabled face problems with focusing on the line and other barriers and problems at the ballot box. Are the ballots accessible for seniors in large fonts? So um, we are actually holding a, um, a special training on the 20th that will demonstrate what the ballot marking devices look like at polling places with ranked choice ballots on them. And um, Amanda, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you can increase the size of the font on a ballot marking device so that you can see what it looks like. Um, I will, that's a really great point, And I think that that should be something that we highlight in the, um, the ballot marking device demonstration that we do. Just like, what does that look like? And what are the limitations of making the font larger for that, for the screen size? with the, the grid next to it and that sort of thing. I'm actually going to answer this question really quickly. Are ballots district specific in terms of languages? To some extent, yes. Um, all ballots in New York City are in, in both English and Spanish. Um, you know, they are also translated into traditional Chinese characters in Brooklyn and Queens in Manhattan. Uh, Korean and Bengali are only available in like parts of Queens on the ballots themselves. Um, so depending on what district you live in and what language coverage there is in that district, you might get different languages on your ballot than what I see on my ballot. Um, then someone asked if someone fills out the ballot wrong, like ranking multiple candidates as the top rank, will there be a ballot curing process? And I think, anyway, will there, this will is there a, be a ballot curing process? This is a great question. Overvoting, which is what you're describing, is not currently a part of the absentee ballot curing process. So the answer is currently no. But we, I think, would advocate strongly. New York City is the only place that is using ranked choice voting in New York State. The rules are, um, the cure procedure is written by the New York State Board of Elections. So I think this is something where there's a place for advocacy to make sure that overvoting is included in the cure process. And if folks on the call are interested in doing that, I think that's a great, 
that's a great thing. I know certainly that we will be advocating for it. This is something that we've identified as an issue. Um, this is a little bit in response uh, to just sort of like how ranked choice voting affects candidate behavior. Um, can RCV le lead to coalition between the candidates, especially within the candidates? So I'll get into this a little bit later. We have seen that in other jurisdictions that a candidate will say, vote for me first, but vote for um, this other candidate second. And then they'll have kind of like a deal with the other candidate. So if I was like, vote for me, Ali, first, vote for Jordan second, Jordan would also tell his supporters, vote for me first, but vote for Ali second. So it's almost a coalition, but it's not really, it's almost like a handshake deal. Um, the other thing too is, just independent without kind of like that deal between two candidates. Other candidates will say to a candidate's main supporter, like you may be voting for this, like I respect that you're voting for this candidate first, but can you vote for me second or third? <laughs> so it is a little bit interesting. It changes the, the calculus and the way that candidates communicate and makes things a little more interesting um, for voters at least. <laughs> um, so, we also have a question like how do we explain our message to voters who may think that ranking when they're ranking candidates they're empowering a second or third choice in the ranking to potentially defeat their first choice if the vote goes to rounds like some folks may want to vote for just one candidate um so maybe we can talk about like clarity how to be really clear about messaging that you're not harming your first choice by like listing a second or third choice yeah, so this is a little intuitive if you like think about it for a second. Your first choice, um, you, you can't harm your first choice by voting for a second or third candidate because your vote would will never go to a second candidate if your first candidate is still in the, is, is still active, is still in the election. So I think an example that I could show here is imagine that our example voter had voted for candidate B as it as her first choice her vote for all of these rounds would have stayed with candidate b because candidate b is the winner of the election at the very end after all the votes are distributed the candidate b is never in last place in any round um, so that's kind of the scenario that you need to think about if your candidate is if your first place candidate is never is never the last place candidate in any round then there, then your vote never moves beyond that candidate. Um, so there's, there's no strategic purpose to, to being afraid to rank a second, third, or fourth choice candidate. It will never harm your first choice one. And just to like be really clear about tabulation, because um, I think it helps to go back to that slide and see how votes are redistributed among candidates. Because we're we've still gotten a couple questions about that. Yeah. Like if, if no one receives a majority in the first round, the, the candidate who's taken out of the tabulation process is the one with the least amount of votes and only their votes get redistributed. Correct. The, and like you see this visually here, candidate D has the um, fewest votes. Their, their bar is grayed out. It used to be orange. Their orange votes are distributed to the other uh, to the other candidates bar charts because those voters ranked those candidates second. So someone put it this way, if, if their first choice candidate is the last place candidate and gets removed, then they just empowered their second choice candidate. I think that's a good way. Yeah, to that is an awesome way to, to think of it. <laughs> um, in terms of like majority, is it 50% plus one? It's 50% plus one vote. <laughs> I always want to say that because the first time I heard that, I, I was like 51%. Why is it 51%? That really confused me. <laughs> it, so I just say more than 50% because we know more than 50% is, you know, intuitively you have to have plus more one vote. You can't have a half a vote. <laughs> All right. Um, so we... Again, there are a lot of questions about like outreach and materials. I am saving those for later. These are great questions. Uh, just focusing on some of the more like technical details right now. Will the okay. BOE report the details of each round when reporting results? Okay, great question. 
Um, short answer, yes, after the certified election results are published for unofficial election night results, which we know um, only takes into account the um, in-person voting. So early voting and election day voting is included in the unofficial election results total that's published the night of election day. Um, that results that are published by the Board of Elections will only include first choice votes. And um, I got into this a little bit on the slide about how we're going to have to wait to know the winner in some cases. Um, the Board of Elections can receive absentee ballots after the after election day and they don't publish those uh, the results of those counts until after they open them, which they're not allowed to do until after election day is over. Um, so I sort of lost track of, oh, <laughs> the original question is when will they publish the tabulation? So there's something called a cast vote record, which includes every round of tabulation that is required to be published with the certified election results. I am hoping that the Board of Elections publishes that sooner. I think there's going to be a lot of interest in Council District 24 to see the results of the ranked choice voting election. Um, published online before the, before the certified election results come in. So we are certainly hoping that that is the case. And if I find out that it's different, I will certainly answer this question differently going forward. <laughs> but for right now, unfortunately, I have to tell you that yes, but it is with the certified election results. So someone asked, and I'm gonna state this in a way, I think I understand the question, and if I don't understand it correctly, we'll come back to it at the end. Um, so Michelle asks, once you choose candidates and you don't know the results, does the loser, who I think is like the last place vote getter, uh, does their votes, do their votes get equally shared with the other four? And the answer is no. <laughs> yes, the answer is no. Um, so in, in on this, oh, I have the right, I even have the right visualization up right now. So in this instance, this is the second round we were talking about the last place candidate is candidate D and their bar chart is orange. As you can see, not everybody who voted for candidate D in this round, whose votes are now being distributed to their next highest ranked candidate, um, not all of them, this is not being distributed equally to each of the remaining three candidates. It's going to the, each voter's next ranked candidate. So some of those voters ranked candidate A second, some of them ranked candidate B second, some of them ranked candidate C second, and you're seeing the, um, the orange that is on this screen displays how many of those voters vote is moving to the other candidates. So it looks like candidate B got the most second place, uh, second choice votes for the people who voted for candidate D first. All right, so the other questions we have are about community outreach, outreach materials, or impacted communities. So I'm gonna save those for after the next section. We also have a fairly specific campaign finance related question that I'm gonna save for the end. So I think Got excited. Move, yeah, let's move on to outreach now and uh, get back to some, we've gotten some really great questions in the Q&A box that we're gonna to get to. Yeah, those were good ones. Um, all right, so thanks everyone for your questions there. That was, those were all really good. Okay, so I'm gonna go into now, why is ranked choice voting voter education important? And I think you're all realizing that the main reason is because this is a little confusing and we wanna make sure that everybody understands what's happening. If voters don't understand how their election system works, they may be discouraged from voting or not understand how to mark a ballot. So those are our two priorities, making sure that people know how to rank, uh, rank candidates and how to mark a ballot and they understand why they wanna do that. So our goal here is, is a successful outreach campaign like they saw in Minneapolis. They first used ranked choice voting in 2009. Um, by the time their second mayoral election rolled around in 2017, most voter, an overwhelming majority of voters found ranked choice voting simple to use. Um, almost 100% of the ballots were cast validly and uh, three fourths of voters ranked multiple choices for mayor. So that indicates they understood who was running, they knew how to mark an, a ranked choice voting ballot. Um, and so that this is after a couple of years of using ranked choice voting, but I just wanted to give this as kind of like a goal post. Like it's, uh, if we do a good job, it is certainly possible that uh, New Yorkers will understand 
ranked choice voting at the level that they did in Minneapolis, but it may take a little bit of time and it's and it's a process for people to understand how to how to rank any type of ballot, but especially a ranked choice voting one. Okay, so we're, how are we going to educate voters about ranked choice voting? We're encouraging folks to incorporate ranked choice voting into their existing get out the vote plans um, as part of convincing voters to turn out in the first place and just making people aware that there's a municipal election happening this year at all. Like we're, we're electing a new mayor, you may be electing a new council member. Um, these are all things that people need to be made aware of and in, in, as part of doing that, you can also mention, of course, how are you electing these people through ranked choice voting? Um, so a, a, a get out the vote campaign is done most effectively two to four weeks before voting starts. And that's just because voters won't remember what you are telling them if they're not using it within two to four weeks. So you really want to um, focus on that and really um, talk about it a lot in the two to four weeks leading up to the election. We have a whole week of early voting that happens before the election now too, so you can actually catch people when they're um, able to go and use early voting, which is great. Um, but we also are encouraging folks to include information about ranked choice voting in your regular communications starting now, um, so voters know that it's coming up. Okay, so we're keeping our messaging and voter uh, we're keeping our messaging and approach voter centric at all times. Um, one of the voters in our ranked choice voting messaging focus group said, this is new to me, but it is just another way of voting. Um, I really loved this quote because it kind of shows that, um, number one, it appears New Yorkers are very, like, they're not afraid of change and um, they encounter new things a lot, like our city is huge and diverse and crazy things happen all the time um, and folks can deal with change as long as they're prepared for it and they know how to um, they know how to approach it and they don't feel like they're surprised. So I think that's really important to remember and this is why we're doing a voter education campaign. Um, the concept of ranking itself is intuitive. Um, like when looking at a menu, you may want pepperoni on your pizza, but then they're out of pepperoni. So you go with peppers instead. Um, this is obviously different. Like you're a voter filling out a ballot, the winner will be your representative. But the, concepts, the concept is similar. Folks um, are used to ranking choices in their head. They just need to know how to fill out the ballot, basically. Um, so our research shows voters want to know why this is happening as well, and that's why we include the information about the fact that it's a ballot question. 74% um, of New Yorkers voted yes, and it, this isn't something that's coming from the top down. Okay, and I mentioned our voter surveys with the Center for Civic Design a little bit. And another thing that we found in this research is that uh, there are lots of different types of voters. There's, everyone is on their own voter journey. I love that word, voter journey. Um, so for, we found about 30% of voters were fit into the first category. They just wanna know the basics, the foundational pieces of information. How do I fill out an RCV ballot? Then there's another group, um, that want to know a little bit more. Why is ranked choice voting happening? Why am I filling out more than one choice on a ballot? How does this impact my favorite candidate? And um, it seems based on your fantastic questions at the break that a lot of you fit at least into this category. Um, and some of you may even fit into the last category, which is voters who want to know all the details. How is my vote tabulated in the rounds? What are the strategies for voting? What is the tabulation going to look like? Um, so, the important thing to know, though, is that this is um, this is something that you can use to like. We're working with community partners because uh, we think it's really important to ground messaging and what you know about your community. So you're the one that will be able to know if your community just needs to know the basics, or wants to know more information, or wants to know everything about ranked choice voting that they can possibly get their hands on. So. Um, we know that all voters, absolutely everybody, is going to need to know how to fill out a ballot, but not all voters want to know the details of how the votes get counted and what the tabulation looks like. So that's just something that we are encouraging folks to use judgment on, and we are encouraging folks to tailor the training that we're going to provide you that you can use to train voters in your community appropriately, depending on those determinations you make. Okay, so what we found when we were talking to voters about the messaging about ranked choice voting is that 
you kind of need to sell it a little bit to them. And what I mean by that is voters want to know why this change took place. And that involves pointing out some of the reasons advocates pointed to for moving from single choice elections to ranked choice voting. Um, so three of the reasons that we found resonated the most with voters um, are the follow, there's three of them. So the first one is voters have more say in who gets elected. The second one is candidates are more likely to appeal to a wider audience. And the third is voters elect more diverse candidates. So just to get a little bit more into detail for each of those, um, you have more say in who gets elected. A couple of the talking points that we found resonated with people to help them understand why they want to rank, why they want to use ranked choice voting and why they would want to rank more than one candidate is in ranked choice voting, even if your top choice does not win, you can still help choose who does win. That's because if your first choice candidate loses, you still have your second, third, fourth, and fifth choice candidates. Um, you can vote for your top choice first without worrying about who is likely to win. So voters don't have to vote strategically or decide between voting for their favorite candidate or the one that's most electable. The second point is that candidates are more likely to appeal to a wider audience. And I got into this a little bit earlier based on one of your questions. So in ranked choice voting elections, candidates can't win only with the support of their base. They hear they have to talk to more voters and they're not only campaigning for first choice votes, but also second, third. And they may actually say that to you. They may actually say, well, if you're not, if you're not gonna vote for me first, will you consider voting for me second or third? Um, and that's because they need to appeal to a wider audience in order to win. In other jurisdictions, this has led to more civility and less negativity between candidates. Um, in some instances, like-minded candidates for the same office have even co-endorsed one another. And I also kind of got into that a little bit before. Um, we've, also, we've also found in other jurisdictions that candidates um, talk about issues that they maybe wouldn't have talked about before because they, you know, they have to appeal to more um, different groups of voters. Okay, and the last one is that voters elect more diverse candidates in ranked choice voting cities. So um, elected officials that are elected using ranked choice voting are more representative of the communities that they serve. Um, in its first year using ranked choice voting, Minneapolis elected its first two transgender council members. Seven cities that use ranked choice voting have either achieved or surpassed gender parity in their city legislature. That means that more than 50% of the people who sit who are city council members are, um, are women or identify as women. And in the 13 largest municipalities that use ranked choice voting, six have women mayors and four have black, Latino, or Asian mayors. So I think this um, kind of goes without saying, like in New York, we've been exceptionally lucky to be able to um, have a lot of diversity in our city council and the representatives that serve our communities are very diverse. Um, but on the citywide elected official level, we haven't really seen as much of that. And so I think that this is an area where um, that messaging really resonates with voters because they, they know that. And that goes into why does this messaging work? Um, so our research has shown us that voters understand ranked choice voting and majority winners after a basic explanation. And they realize that, you know, it's preferable to have someone who wins with the most percentage of the vote as they possibly can get. The second thing is they like the idea that many candidates are going to focus on appealing to them. And I thought this was really funny as somebody who gets a lot of um, election mail, the idea that a lot of voters thought it was cool that they would be getting more election mail. It's like, really? You want more election mail? Okay. <laughs> um, but folks did say that. And then the third piece is voters value the diversity of New York City and they want representatives who look like the city they represent. Um, and I sort of talked about that in, in a good amount of detail in the last slide. Okay, so the key takeaways for folks who are on this call who are planning on uh, trying to educate their own communities about ranked choice voting and who wanna partner with the CFP to do so, um, we would like you to be able to review materials and get comfortable talking about ranked choice voting determine your outreach plan for voters before the election, take our ranked choice voting in NYC presentation and customize it. And that's the training that we're gonna to provide to you folks after this one that you can use to, you know, kind of put together a customized training to give to your communities and we can help you do that too. And then this, the next step would be conducting trainings with your members or constituents 
you don't have to do 10 of them. You can do one, you can do two. This isn't a huge ask. It's just, I think, something that we think is hugely important to hear from uh, a member of your own community about something that is confusing to you. It's like way, way better than me talking to everybody. <laughs> Um, and then incorporating ranked choice voting into your get out the vote plan. We recommend you start one month before the election. And then lastly, you can check NYC votes emails and social media for more resources. We're posting a lot about ranked choice voting. And every time we have something new, those are the places that you should go to to, um, to see them first. Okay, so voter education next steps. And for those of you who are lucky enough to live in Queens, there are two special elections in February for council districts 24 and then 31. Next up in March is districts 11 and 15 in the Bronx. And then in the primary election, for those of you who are registered to a political party, everyone, in, uh, everyone who's registered to a political party will be able to vote in the primary election in June. Okay, so this is just to orient everybody, and I know we have a lot of Queens folks on the call. So again, thank you for being here. You're, you are the first special election in Queens District 24. Um, the special election is on February 2nd, and early voting is from January 23rd to the 31st. Next up is Queens District 31, and that's on February 23rd. Early voting is from the 13th to the 21st. And next up, we have Bronx special elections, and both of these are happening. Um, the one in District 11 and the one in District 15 are both happening on March 23rd, with early voting from March 13th to the 21st. And then by June, we have a much larger group of people. Um, it's everybody who's registered to a political party can vote um, in the primary elections for mayor, public advocate, comptroller, all five borough presidents and 51 city council races. So early voting is from June 12th to the 20th there. Okay, so these are, these are other resources for ranked choice voting information. Obviously, I'm going to recommend that you go to the New York City Campaign Finance Board's website. You can go to voting.nyc to get there. Um, we have an, a ranked choice voting landing page, which is nyccfb.info slash rcv. Um, you can also find a link to our FAQs, and then all of you already know this, but we also host our RSVPs for trainings there. So you can point folks to our website after you are finished doing this training and you're like, this is so amazing, I want to tell people about it. Please do, and please um, tell folks to sign up for Train the Trainers on our website. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at NYC Votes. Okay, and I'm also gonna plug the um, New York City Board of Elections website as well. They have information about ranked choice voting at vote.nyc. They have special elections info, including um, the hours of poll site operations, and you can look up your poll site at the poll site locator. And you can also follow them on Twitter at BOENYC. Okay, and last but not least, you can always reach out to us with any questions. Amanda and I, are happy to answer any questions you have and you can also send your questions to our NYC votes mailbox as well. And um, I should mention that everyone will receive a follow-up email from us probably on Monday that contains all of this information just reiterated so that you have it all in one place. All right, so I'm happy to answer any additional questions and to um, call on folks who have had their hands raised as well. All right, so time to come back to all those questions about uh, community outreach and impacted communities. Um, but since we did get a few questions about uh, materials just before you addressed it in your slides, I wanna reiterate to folks, we are making this training available. We're gonna follow up with resources, with all links to everything we just described. We're, we'll send those in an email to you. Uh, we're going to give you a link to a Google folder where we're dropping in resources as well. And we're also um, always always happy to like help you help you think about how to really tailor this for your respective communities. Because uh, as Ali said, um, you know we we don't think we're necessarily the experts in every community. We we need our partners to do that. 
Um, so we can offer this sort of like high level expertise and then work with all of you to tailor it as needed. Um, so first off, just to go back to some of our earlier questions, and I'm actually going to field this one from Raul. Uh, what has the outreach been to NYCHA residents? So I will say two things. Um, first of all, we work with NYCHA routinely. They're what's known as a local law 29 agency, which means they have to offer uh, voter registration opportunities to their customer base. Uh, so we always work with the voter coordinators at agencies like NYCHA to get this information out into the world, um, which we are planning on doing. There is also pending council legislation that would codify this into law. Um, so that's something we're doing on that front. However, I would say that our team has also found that sometimes uh, it's better to work with tenant association presidents and folks who are on the ground and, and really linked to NYCHA residents. Um, so we do a lot of outreach to the tenant association presidents. Like that being said, sometimes we hear back, sometimes we don't. I see we have some folks from council member offices on this call. Um, to the extent that you have relationships with the tenant association presidents and NYCHA developments, particularly in these districts with early special elections, um, we'd love your help, uh, helping us link up to make sure that we are getting out into those communities. All right, next up, uh, how will outreach look for non-English speaking communities and what resources are available for trainers to use? Um, Allie, would you like me to field that one too? I can just like go down the list, okay. Um, so, go for it, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Uh, we'll give you a break. Allie was losing her voice yesterday, so we want to make sure she still has it by the end of this call. Um, so at the Campaign Finance Board, we translate our materials into the languages covered by the Voting Rights Act. So that's Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Bengali. Um, so we are translating voter-facing presentations in those languages. We're also working with partner organizations to really help us with those translations. Um, and also to deliver those trainings. So on, with Spanish, we're working with Dominicanos USA and Naleo um, in some of the Asian languages, uh, including possibly, I think, Punjabi beyond what's officially included in the Voting Rights Act written translations. Uh, we're working with APA Voice. Um, we have been talking with uh, folks at City Hall and the Civic Engagement Commission to get materials translated into other languages um, and we're currently pricing that out uh, right now. They've sent that to their translators that they have under contract to see what it would take to get things translated. Um, that being said, they make things available in the citywide languages. So that includes Russian, Haitian Creole, uh, Polish, Arabic, Urdu, and French, I believe. I was missing a language when I talked about this yesterday. So, even with the Voting Rights Act languages and the citywide languages, we know New York City is an incredibly diverse city. We know that there are a lot more languages spoken than these languages. Um, and we don't have like translators to translate into all those languages. And that is where we come to rely on community partners um, and would love to work with you to translate into languages beyond the citywide languages. Um, so I would say that the resources we've talked about today, just in terms of what's going on the website, the materials like the one pager we're handing out, the trainings, like we're, we're working to get those translated into the, on our side, the Voting Rights Act languages, and we're trying to work with City Hall to get those into the additional citywide languages as well. So this is a bigger question uh, from Todd that, you know, we could talk about a little bit. Uh, can we please speak about the impact of RCV and whether it's welcomed within Black communities and people of color? And I think it's fair to say that within all communities, like first of all, uh, ranked choice voting enjoyed wide support across the entire city. Um, you know, when you look at maps of how the vote broke down, uh, people were pretty much in favor of it across the city and we didn't see a ton of disparities in communities around New York and we do study those demographic trends. Like that being said, I think that, you know, there are, there are people who are rightfully concerned anytime that there are changes to the elections process. Um, you know, we all, have got, we all have gotten used to voting a certain way. I think folks have learned um, you know, how to make the election system work for them for a long time. And now we're upending the system. 
Um, and I think that there's going to be just some trepidation about like learning that new system, learning how to make it work for different communities. Um, so, you know, we, we have heard criticism about it. We've heard a lot of support as well. And I, I don't feel writ large that any one community is like universally for it or universally against it. I think we've just, you know, we've heard like mixed things from every community. But when we look at how people actually voted, communities across New York City voted in favor of it. So I think like for us, I think we're just trying to be mindful when we're talking to different communities who have had different experiences, particularly around systemic barriers and disenfranchisement, um, just to think about like how, how it's being received to have this new system of voting, um, especially when folks have learned to like empower themselves with what we have right now. So I hope that answers the question and we're happy to sort of come back to this at the end if, if someone wants to raise their hand and talk about this further. Uh, so Raul asks, uh, I, I touched on this earlier, if materials will be in, available in Haitian Creole, Yiddish and Polish. Um, so first of all, like we are trying to work with City Hall and the Civic Engagement Commission that would get tra uh, materials translated into Haitian Creole and Polish, but not Yiddish, which is not one of the citywide languages. Um, we did work with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs back in 2016 to translate voter registration forms into additional languages um, based on data analysis about what are the limited English proficient communities that also have uh, citizens of voting age. So this is something that falls outside the citywide languages um, but you know, is something something we should think about as well. Um, how does the city decide where interpreters will be sent? So the Civic Engagement Commission um, offers interpreters in the citywide languages beyond uh, the Voting Rights Act. Um, so the Board of Elections covers those Voting Rights Act languages that I mentioned. Uh, Civic Engagement Commission covers the other ones. Um, you know, I, I can't speak off the top of my head too in depth of like how they make those determinations. But what we do know is they look at census data about where people who are limited English proficient live and map that onto poll sites um, and make determinations about like where to send people there. Um, so is there election district level data on where these languages and other languages are spoken? Um, there is census tract level data, which a lot of us, including those of us at the Campaign Finance Board, um, use to like map election districts onto those census tracts because the boundaries don't line up perfectly, but you can get a pretty good sense of where the language needs are across New York City, even if the maps don't like perfectly align. All right. Uh, so one thing I just want to um, address in the chat box that I'm seeing from Farron. Hi, Farron. How are you? <laughs> um, so you're correct. 17% of New York City voters uh, voted in November 2019. Um, it was not a presidential election. In New York City, we have, uh, we saw about 63% turnout in the presidential election in November. Um, and what that means is 63% of the registered voters in New York turned out to vote. <laughs> um, so what, um, what we're hearing, and I think this is just a matter of contextualization, and we talk about this a lot, uh, the Campaign Finance Board um, publishes an annual voter analysis report if you're interested in seeing the turnout rates every year. Um, 2019 did not have any regularly scheduled elections, so it would have normally been an, a very low turnout year. 17% is actually pretty high for that year, and we've seen increased uh, turnout since 2016 in New York. Um, but I will say that in municipal election years, about 25% of voters turn out in the general election. Um, I don't wanna get into a situation where we talk about the legitimacy of a vote based on what the turnout is, but I will acknowledge that uh, turnout rates in state and local election years are, are fairly low in New York regularly. Um, so 17% isn't by any means the lowest number, uh, the lowest amount of turnout that we've seen. Um, I know that sounds really low and it's part of our mission to increase turnout and um, we're fairly new. We've only been around for a decade, but we're certainly happy to see the level of interest 
um, and the increased voter turnout, even though it still isn't at the level that we'd hope to see it at um, in New York City. Yeah, to echo Allie, um, you know, the way we think about it, like, listen, decisions are made by people who show up. And what we work to do every day is to increase the number of people who show up. Um, and that's what I think a lot of you who are on this call want to do as well. Um, so like we want to see higher turnout in every election. We want to see higher turnout in this coming election because even though we all know it's a big election year, turnout is going to be much lower than it is in a presidential election year. And the way we talk to voters about this when we're, we're giving workshops and trainings and when we're out in the field is basically like, hey, you can decide to stay home, but that means someone else is going to make decisions for you. So, you know, I, do, I have heard this conversation of just like, oh, there was only 17% turnout in this election uh, where, where ranked choice voting was passed. It's like, yeah, but then that other 83% of voters decided to let the 17% who showed up make the decisions for them. So we wanna change that game overall and in the long term. Um, but yeah, in general, especially after the events of yesterday, I am incredibly nervous about questioning the legitimacy of any election outcome. Um, you know, I think this was decided fairly, regardless of the number of people who turned up and people voted in favor of it, and now it's the law. So like we collectively together are gonna make sure that we are educating voters to the best of our ability. All right. In terms of community outreach, in addition to trainings like this, what strategies are being used to ensure there's widespread education on RCV? So I would say a few things. Um, many of you gave up a Thursday evening to like be here with us on this training, but we know that there are millions of people across New York City. Just to contextualize that, I think there are about 80,000 registered voters in Council District 24, um, but there are going to be three over 3 million eligible voters for the June primary. So this is how we're thinking about it in terms of scale. We have a few ways of reaching out to people at that kind of scale. First of all, we mail the, the voter guide to every, every registered voter in New York City. As Ali mentioned, we've done a lot of research, not only how to make this voter guide better, how to make it stand out in your mailbox, how to make people open it, but also how do we explain ranked choice voting in a way that people can digest and understand in that voter guide. Um, two, we, we do have advertising campaigns we run before every election and we advertise to people um, on, like through a variety of methods. So it's, you know, I think when people hear advertising, they might think TV, they might think subways and buses and then question if that's like really uh, effective. Um, we advertise to people through a lot of different methods and we're always looking at, you know, was this effective to reach out to the community where we wanted to reach out to. Um, we're always driving people to web resources, for example, to tools like the voter guide. Uh, and we're also making those tools available for all of you to distribute. So this is a train the trainer. Um, this is to get all of you to a level of expertise where you're comfortable talking about it to other people. We do rely on these on people who will then go out and train their communities and be, you know, really like amplifiers of this effort because we can't we can't train everyone in New York City. We would really like to, but uh, I think our numbers on this call show that we can't. So that that's what I would say overall. It's like it's sort of a multi pronged strategy. Some of which relies on on those big products like the voter guide. Some of which relies on wide scale things like advertising. Um, and some of it which relies on community partners. Um, all right. <laughs> Would, will you provide a PowerPoint Google slide version for us to steal and customize for our groups? Yes, absolutely. We are going to be following up with that. That will be a part of the follow-up email that we send out. Yeah. Um, someone said, I assume RCV will be available for early voting and vote by mail. Yes. Like, uh, of course. In all, yeah, it will be available regardless of whether you choose to cast your ballot in person early uh, or at, by absentee. Um, sorry, I'm sort of skipping around now to make sure we save some of like the specific questions for the end. Someone asked, uh, can you show us a ranking using the sample ballot for the special election? Um, I don't think we have a visual of that right now, do we? We don't, and I don't want to start selecting candidates for an election I can't vote in. 
Um, so, and I also don't really know how to write on my screen and share it, <laughs> but <laughs> I see where you're going with that. Um, I think that the, any sample ballot that you're going to see will not have a candidate name on it because again, we're a government agency, we're nonpartisan, we don't want to be in a situation where we're, <laughs> where we're telling people to vote for candidates or what it's going to look like. Um, but that's why we show you the sample ballot that has candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, candidate D, um, where there is one candidate chosen for each of the columns. I think that's the, the best way to describe how to correctly mark a ballot. Um, okay. In regards to ballot printing, layout, and outreach, the Manhattan DA race will also be on the ballot along with municipal races. The DA race does not fall under RCV. How will that be positioned on the ballot to not confuse voters and how do we do outreach around this? Yeah, that's, this is a really fair and you have another great question. <laughs> um, so the, yes, the DA's race will be single choice. There will be other elections in, um, I think you use Manhattan as an example that will be using ranked choice voting like the mayor's race and uh, city council and borough president. So um, I would say that there, in all likelihood, the the way that it will be differentiated is there the single choice election will appear on a different page than the ranked choice voting election. We already know that the ballots are going to be multiple pages because there are so many um, elections in twenty in 2021 in the primary election. So um, that's just something that I think folks need to be aware of. And I think it's really great to highlight that, that there's going to be single choice elections on the same ballot as uh, ranked choice voting elections. And we just need to tell folks and remind them that once um, it's getting closer to the election, make sure that you flip your ballot, make sure that you um, are voting for every um, office that, that you know is up for election as well, that you wanna vote in. All right. Um, are there any more trainings after this one? I'm just going to answer that because <laughs> I don't have the link off the top of my head. So many uh, trainings. <laughs> we're going to be having trainings every, we have Wednesday lunchtime trainings from 12 to 1.30. We're also going to be having trainings every week at exactly this time that you all joined. Um, so Jordan, would you mind finding the training link and dropping it in the chat box? Because that would be great. Um, and Nicole has a comment that she would love to see or hear an example of how votes will be tabulated in a race that has more than five candidates. Okay, got it. Okay. So um, that's I, something we've actually heard from a couple of folks and that's just a matter of like mocking up something that looks like that. That's a really yeah. good point. I think we can create that just to like help folks visualize it. Um, we also got a question, is Democracy NYC also going to do voter education? So we work very closely with Democracy NYC. They're actually one of the offices we're coordinating with to expand language offerings um, and make sure that we're coordinating this campaign. Um, so, you know, I think they are still working out some of the details of what they're doing, but we, we talk on a sometimes daily basis. Daily basis. We <laughs> pretty closely. Um, all right, so some of the questions or comments that are left are really more about like debating the virtues of ranked choice voting. I think I'll state it that way. Um, so maybe we can just like take a couple minutes after this training to talk about that. I realize we're at time, so some folks may have to drop off. Um, I think that, um, you know, we, we've really gone through and answered um, a bunch of the more technical questions. Um, I think it's just, there were just some questions about like how long it's taken other places to implement, um, you know, what critics of ranked choice voting say, things like that. Um, so I think if we have a few minutes we can give, like we can talk about that a little bit, but for anyone else who had questions about like the, the other substance of the training, we'll wrap that up now. Um, yeah, I'm seeing, oh, I'm also seeing lots of information to absorb, need a simple way of speaking about this. We will have a one pager published in multiple languages available on our website um, that we will, um, that will also include the link to our RCB landing page. That's where that will appear. And you will also get a link to a Google Drive folder that will include all translated materials that we have too. 
All right, Nicole pointed out her hand is still up and she's asked a number of questions about tabulation. So Nicole, how about uh, we call on you now um, just to, uh, to ask your questions. Hi, Nicole. Hi, hi, good evening. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, I just, so I really have three questions on the tabulation piece. Um, okay. One of them, so I, I want to know if the majority number changes based on the, the voter exhausting. Like, so for instance, 100 people vote in an election, everybody has a first choice, but then the vote goes to the second round and only, you know, let's say only 90 people continue to vote. So for that second round, is the majority based on the 90 or is the majority based on 100? Okay, great question. So for the first round where you're determining if the if anybody has over 50% of the vote and is an outright winner where you don't need to go into the RCV tabulation, right. um, all 100 of those voters are taken into account for that 50%. So you would need 51 voters to vote for you in order to outright win. Right. Um, moving forward, as and I think in this example, you're, you're um, contemplating that 10 ballots, 10 voters have an exhausted ballot. Right. Okay. So ten ballots yes. are exhausted It'll when twenty six. So you're saying that only ninety voters have a second choice in this? Yes. Instance. Yes. Yes. Okay. So ten ballots have been exhausted in that instance. Yes. yes. Cool. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm sticking with you. Okay. So, in short. There is at no point during that period where that 50% threshold is then applied in the rounds. It keeps going until there are only, every single round runs through where votes are distributed until there are two candidates remaining. Okay. The candidate who has the most votes wins. The law does not specify that the winning candidate must have 50% of the vote. And so I think you correctly pointed out that if there are enough exhausted ballots at that point, the winner may not have 50% of the remaining votes. Oh, sorry, so, sorry, so, sorry, so, sorry, 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 sorry. Nicole, I'm sorry, I just confused myself. The winner may not have 50% of that original 100 people who voted. They will always have more than 50% of the remaining votes. Okay, okay. okay. So I think I, so I think you're saying that yes, that the number does change because they'll just have, they'll have a majority of whatever is left. Correct. <laughs> Okay. Okay. And then the other question is, I was trying to get, you know, and I thought the ballot that you shared was the one from the 24th. But what I also, I want to see how it looks. So for instance, there's about eight candidates running or seven yep. candidates on the ballot. If we're going to the second round, is it all, so, so for instance, I know you we're ranking up to five and then we're saying whoever comes in last place, does that mean last place out of the top five or if there's seven candidates is it the candidate that's in the seventh you know the least amount of votes so voter you know number seven and then yep. we're working through it that way so it's six then five then until Correct. someone gets a majority yep that's second piece what you said so every candidate is ranked from the most votes to the least votes in the first yep. round the yeah. candidate who has the least votes is the candidate that is eliminated and whose voters votes are distributed to their next highest choice in the next round. Got it. And then whoever gets that 50 plus 1% is then declared the winner. Correct. However, I will just note for you, and this is like mathematically impossible at <laughs> this point, if someone does get 50% or more, they are the winner. Um, but in the tabulation process, we're still going down to those two candidates so we can see who has the most, the greatest mandate to, to be elected, essentially, is, is what we're saying. Okay, so what you're saying, so, so for instance, if, so once someone hits that threshold, technically they've won, but like, let's say they win in the second round, right? Like, let's say it's seven candidates, no one gets the uh, majority, you go to the second round, someone does get the majority, but you're still saying you will go until there's only two left? Yeah, the votes would just be distributed so that it's displayed so you have an idea of who the other voters voted for as second, third, fourth, fifth, 
so that the candidate who wins, you're correct, it will still be the same person who was the winner in round two, because as we know, the law of percentages is once you have over 50% um, of the vote, then there's no other person who can have more. They can catch you. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I keep saying the law of percentages, and I, this is the best indicator of all that I have never taught math to anybody. <laughs> it's not a thing. <laughs> this is the conversation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think I, I think I'm clear. Thank you. <laughs> I, I felt like I wasn't stating your questions clearly, like throughout the process. It's okay, and it's tricky. It's tricky. Thank you so much. <laughs> um. All right. So. We have a couple of questions from someone who left, but I want to make sure we address them for the group. Um, although we just got a question in the chat box, if a candidate can actually win as a fourth choice with remaining votes. Um, so maybe we can tackle that first before we get to some of these other more like system questions. Let me read this. <laughs> okay. A candidate can actually win as a fourth choice with the remaining votes. Okay, so. We saw in the example <laughs> that um, the person, the example ballot that I ran through with the colorful bar charts, that single voter um, voted for the candidate who ultimately ended up winning as third on their ballot. So conceivably for you as an individual voter, if you had voted for candidate B um, in that example, and there were actually five candidates running, because let's be serious, but that doesn't make sense otherwise. Um, it could be your fourth choice that ends up winning. Is that what you're asking, Farron? Which in turn can actually be the same as a winner takes all in a crowded race with, with let's say 23% of the votes. I'm not quite sure based on the question I'm pulling the chat, sorry. Um, okay, so you're saying that there could be an instance where when we get to the final round, only 23% of voters are still active is that the still have active ballots, I guess, is the question. That would be, ex <laughs> I feel we're like having a back and forth right now. This is good. <laughs> um, that would be exceedingly rare, Farron. Um, I don't think that that's ever. Hi, how are you? I love your background. Thank you. Um, hi, Amanda. Hi, Allie. Um, so based on the, what the question that Nicole just asked and then what you answered when you broke down, when she broke down the question of the first person out of the, out of the hundred, she started with a hundred, right? Mm -hmm. So 50 plus the one, 51 in that case would move on, you know, if they, if they get, if the winner gets it, then it was 50 plus the one, then that is fine, right? But her question was if their first person does it, so 10 people exhausted the ballot, right? They exhausted mm -hmm. the ballot, it was 90 people left. 90 voters left. So out of their choice, out of their choices, you stated that it's, she asked the question of, so it will be the remainder, not the full hundred. It's, it would be based on what's remaining votes, correct? Y so in yes, essence, I think, so yeah, I think yes. Essence, no, I'm just in, so in essence, the, the, Someone can actually still win when when it takes all of the vote with like twenty three percent. So the whole range voting, right? The whole range choice voting was to eliminate that, and for you. So to win. hold on two seconds. Can you define what you mean by winner takes all? So as we have it now, prior to well, well it's, in, it's in law now. So prior to ranked choice voting, it was winner takes all. So in a crowded race of okay. ten candidates, somebody could win with seventeen percent. Out of the 10 candidates, a uh, city council race, someone, okay, I, yes. a candidate could win with 17% yeah. of the votes, right? Correct. Okay, I see where you're going with this. And it takes all. That's, yes. Okay, right, I see what you're saying. And I will tell you that this is one of the reasons why I will never say to you that the person who ends up winning a ranked choice voting election will have greater than 50% of every single person's vote in the election. That's not, that's not true. And I will never say that. <laughs> um, there are instances oh, where, it, there are instances where, uh, and I'm thinking of just one election in San Francisco, people love to use this as an example. There were 17 candidates. And um, I believe so many ballots were exhausted by that point that only 27% of the votes were still active from the first round to the 16th round. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's the one that I think of a lot and I think it gets talked about a lot, but there have been uh, more than 600 ranked choice voting elections in New York City in the last um, 20 years. In San Francisco, they've been using ranked choice voting since 2005 now. Um, and they actually have moved from using three ranks to using 10. And I think that's too, too many, but here's the thing. They identified that it was actually a problem that there were exhausted ballots in, in that specific situation. And they wanted people to have the ability to rank more people so that there would be fewer exhausted ballots. And so what I will say about that <laughs> is, um, yes, there are a handful of examples and they are unusual. What I will say about ranked choice voting, and this is true, is that more candidates have a majority win than they would otherwise in plurality voting. <laughs> And that involves a comparison point. So that I know to be true. The other part where every candidate has to have 50% or higher to win, that is not true once you go through the ranked choice voting tabulation process because of exhausted ballots. And that's why I will never say that to you. Because <laughs> I didn't think about it until she just until she just broke it down with the hundred. Yeah. So ten, you know, ninety was left, ten exhausted their ballot. And she asked the question, is there the tabulation based on the overall 100 or what is remaining? And being as what is remaining, that number is dwindled down. That it, it decreases because it's, some of them were already exhausted. Correct. But I want to emphasize that every person's first choice is counted. No, oh, yes. No, I, I fully understand that from the okay, beginning. Cool. No, I've definitely just moving past if no one wins in the first round because I just want to make sure that I have an understanding if I'm asked, you know, the question. Yep, um, absolutely. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Oh, yes. Another thing I will just mention is that in ranked choice voting elections, um, half of them are decided in the first round. Half of them have results mm -hmm. where a single candidate uh, gets more than 50% of the vote. So I will just mention that. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I think we just have a couple more minutes. Um, I just want to uh, say, say like thanks to everyone for their questions. I think we've actually talked a lot about ballot exhaustion, um, which sort of came up in some of the questions before. So I don't know that we really need to belabor that point. Um, and other than that, I think that um, I'm not really seeing new questions. Um, other than I'm, I'm now seeing some concerns of like, what if ballot exhaustion is really high? I think, you know, I would say we're gonna find out. I think, <laughs> Ali, from what it sounds like from the research though, like we know two thirds of elections in New York City are, are decided with less than 50% of the vote right now. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and so in like two thirds of elections, people are winning without majority support. And even if we do see instances around the country where people like where you do have that these cases like in San Francisco where there's one race with a ton of candidates and a number of ballots get exhausted. I think what we've seen across the board is people win with more support than they are in New York City elections right now. Is that sort of like a fair way of stating it? Yeah, it's, and again, we haven't had a ring choice, we haven't used ring choice voting yet. So we don't actually know what the results are going to be. Um, I can only speak to what has happened in other jurisdictions. And that has been what they've experienced. All right, well, I think we are wrapped up. I know uh, it's been a long training. So thank you for those of us who stuck with us to the end. Um, thank you, Allie, so much. We like to play a game of let's ask Allie every question that we can and see if we can ever trick her into not knowing an answer. And we haven't found one yet. Except um, if it's a math question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so I really want to thank uh, everyone for joining and for the great questions that you got. Thanks, everyone. And just remember, we're going to um, have a follow-up email for you on Monday. There will be a short survey. You can include some feedback on how you thought the, um, the presentation went. Like for example, Nicole said that she would love to see what it looks like to, um, to have a d distribution with more than five candidates. I think that's a great point. And we actually heard that yesterday too. Um, so feedback from you folks is really important. We're gonna try and incorporate it in our future trainings and um, feel free to reach out with us to us if you have any questions. Thanks so much for coming.